Whether you're new to this channel or you're already a subscriber, I want to take this moment to explain exactly what I'm doing, the reason this channel exists. I have been tasked by the Sogelman Tellurian family to tell his story. After a hundred years, no one ever came to him or the family and asked them, we want to tell Sogelman's side of the story. That's my job. This channel is not just, yes, it's about Nagorno-Karabakh and what's going on now. But the reason that's important is because of the Armenian genocide that happened 105 years ago, or began 105 years ago. Some say it ended in 1923. I say it hasn't ended yet, that it's just been delayed. And that's what we're seeing in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's an ongoing genocide. The mere fact of denialism that Turkey has suppressed the truth for over 100 years, that's a continuation, a continual act of genocide. The killings happened, and then the all-out assault in erasing history, that's genocide as well. It's not a genocide that happened. It's a genocide that's currently happening. And Turkey and Azerbaijan squeezing in on Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia, right in the middle. That's the importance of what I'm doing here, but not just this YouTube channel, the Sogomon Tellurian story. If this conflict is not resolved in the next few months, it's going to continue, it's going to continue. And we have the power in Hollywood to tell stories that change the world. That's a fact. I hate to bring in Star Wars, but look, it's so immersed in our culture. It's affected people. If you tell the Sogomon Tellurian story the right way, people's eyes are going to open up to what's happening today, not just 100 years ago, today. So the story has to be told correctly. Now, uh, I had an interview recently. It's on, it's on this channel. You can go find it with uh, Dr. Pamela Steiner, a Harvard psychologist, who also happens to be the great-granddaughter of Henry Morgenthau, who is the U.S. ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. He was right down the hall from Talat Pasha, like the, the architect of this genocide. And she gave her assessment of Sogomon uh, and his trial. So I'll let you, I have another message. The reason I'm saying this is, for those of you who are out there watching this, this has been an eventful week. People are trying to tell the Sogomon Tellurian story, which is good. And this is a message to those people out there who are wanting to tell the Sogomon Tellurian story. You can't tell this story the wrong way. You'll waste the opportunity. There's one way to tell it. I'm happy to work together with everyone that wants to tell this story. But it has to be told a specific way. I've been appointed by the family. I want to work together with anybody out there that loves this story. And I have a message specifically for you at the end of this. But here's um, a snippet from the long interview with uh, psychologist Pam Steiner, um, where she, she gives her assessment of Sogomon Tellurian. So, Pam, if you've been watching these episodes, almost always they circle back around the story of Solomon Tellurian. And also, I should say that for those of you who are new to this channel and are watching this now, I'd ask you to go back and watch some of the earlier episodes to find out why Michael and I are appearing on this show called Hollywood in History. But based on what you, Pam, what, based on what you have read and learned about Solomon Tellurian, is there a way that you can... And this is, again, a question I always like to ask historians or people who uh, have, or maybe they they come at it from different specialties. But as a psychologist, how would you understand him and his actions? How would I understand his actions? Mm -hmm. Or describe them or contextualize them? Well, I, I, I would say that he was in an absolute rage of agony. Um at the injustice and the wrongs. And um, because uh, Talat wasn't being punished, he was going to do it. And uh, Talat had it coming to him. And it was too bad that um, the law couldn't, there wasn't law to take over. But that's, he was enacting righteous vengeance in my view understandable. I mean, 
whether I don't, I don't think he was crazy myself. I surely everybody's mind would be disturbed after being through that. But you know, yeah, I, that's. All right, Michael, if you like. Wow, I'm actually glad you asked that question, Armin, because uh, that answer just confirms everything that I've, the conclusions I've come to. Now, I'm not a historian. I don't have a PhD or even an MA in history, but I feel like I've gotten close to the equivalent of, of uh, that kind of education, just specifically on Sogolman Tellurian. And having read his memoir and knowing his family and doing this research into some, you know, prime, prime resources, primary. the guy was just primary resources. The guy was just doing the right thing because nobody else would. And, and even in the trial and the transcript, he was psychoanalyzed by several, like three, at least three different um, clinicians. And all of them said, no, he's, he's in his right mind. He does not show the signs of somebody who's deranged or, or psychotic. He's, he was driven by justice. So when you said it was a righteous vengeance or a righteous rage, it was, uh, I like that answer. <laughs> um, all right. So a couple quick questions. Uh, so I just say is, something quickly. Yes. One of the, the thing is with trauma, one of the ways to heal is to have a release of the fight, flight, fight or flight. I had a client once who had been, um, her boyfriend had attempted to strangle her a couple times and she was terrified and had managed to get away from him, but she was still very traumatized. And in my office, she was describing it one time and she took off after she told me about it. She ran out of the office, never came back again. She was exercising the flight. She was not able to exercise to get away from him years and years before. And a few years after that, she called me up to thank me. She said she was happily married. That had healed her. It was interesting that you mentioned a lot of the memoirs. Likely people didn't necessarily talk about how they felt um, to, to get an assessment of their psychological state. But in well, we have Sogelman's memoirs about to come out. Well, it's almost done being translated. And he does, the, the night after he assassinated Talat, he describes sitting in the jail cell and describing freedom. Like, it's this perfectly like cinematic irony that he was, he was in bondage to this task and it was the fight task. Like, it, I've got to fight this guy. He's getting away. He can't get away with it. And he represented all of Armenia. And then he succeeds. And he's sitting in a jail cell, locked up, where he's supposed to be in bondage. And he's free. He describes it for the first time. Literally describes wandering the earth. There's so many possibilities out there. There's this girl I'm in love with that I want to marry. I want to have a family. It was like the first time he could even think about those things. That's wonderful. So, So there's so much to the story, the Sogelman story. It's more than a court trial. It's more than a world changing court trial. It can't be about his lawyer, for example. This is not a story about his lawyer. His, his lawyer is important, but there's a lot of important characters in this. Uh, and this is not just a movie. This is long form. That's what we're developing. Long form storytelling. The court will be a whole season's worth of content. The court trial and everything surrounding it. That's a whole season. I, season four, if you will. But there's a season one, two, and three that tell this whole story. The whole story of the Armenian genocide. The history of the Armenians under oppression. The Ottoman Bank. The, uh, the defense of Vaughn. The abandonment of the Armenians by the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, this is a big story. Um, and so it's going to take a lot of people to come on board and work together to do it correctly with the blessing of the Sogolman Tellurian family.